Like, I don't have a choice. I have to. It's not a choice to be courageous or brave. I just have to be courageous and brave because I want to be supported and I want to support. You know, it's so important. I was there not getting support. I was there and feeling all hopeless and powerless and confused and scared and judged. But that's why I feel like this platform of or this peer support group will do good to other people who are struggling because they shouldn't be alone. No one should be alone in any kind of situation when they're struggling, I feel. Welcome to The Narratives of Suicide, the podcast where we bring hope, community and a voice to those who've lost to suicide. It's where we dispel the myths of suicide We dispel historical discourses and constructs that have been steeped in history for a very long time. And we're here with hope, love and support for everyone out there who needs to listen to this podcast. I'm so sorry you're here, but I do hope it can give you something to use in your healing process. To be able to pick up the pieces of suicide and put them back together again in the best possible way that you can. Okay, so today on the episode, we're graced to have Kakna all the way from Malaysia. And I think that's such an opportunity today to speak to you, Kak, about how you've experienced suicide loss. So very sorry to hear you lost a loved one to suicide almost 10 years ago. So you're on the journey with us suicide loss survivors. And we're very honoured to have you here because I know for all of us on this journey, it can be really difficult to assimilate that loss with life. And I think a lot of our listeners here are, you know, the Western world, I'm in the UK. So I'd love to hear first about your laws in Malaysia and how that works. I don't understand the culture fully. I don't understand the legal system around suicide. And I'd love to hear what that's like in your country. So welcome. Anyway, welcome to the podcast today. (laughs) Yeah, thank you, Sue. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am truly on it. Nervous as it is, but I feel like I must show up. I must be here not only for you, not only for the podcast, but especially for the people who are struggling. I was there one. Well, I still am struggling. There are times when it's harder than usual, but losing a loved one to suicide is really painful, as we know. And I felt really alone. And it's not easy because of the culture. And since mental health and suicide is not something that we as Malaysians are comfortable talking about, the stigma is so high here. And the law, for your information, in Malaysia, we are still decriminalizing suicide attempters. That means if someone is caught trying to attempt suicide, trying to take their own life and did not complete the attempt, they will be handed to the police, to the authorities, and they will have to either pay penalty or be jailed even. So that's the situation here. And a lot of mental health NGOs and some politicians here are trying to move forward with the agenda of decriminalizing suicide. Mm -hmm. But it's still an ongoing debate. We're still not there yet. Singapore, actually. Singapore, our neighbor country, has decriminalized suicide on the 1st of January 2020, so quite recently. Wow, wow. Yeah. Wow. So perhaps everyone in the area <laughs> yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. is still following the law. And yeah, I'm not sure, but Singapore is one of them definitely who just decriminalized suicide. And I applaud Singapore for that. Mm. And I just hope that soon enough, when there's enough pressure, enough understanding from the more people speak and, and stand up and fight for it, the law will change because it doesn't help. It totally doesn't help having the law in such a way because then the people who attempt suicide will be labeled as criminals Mm -hmm. when they actually need mental health support, not being punished, not have extra problems on top of their already immense problems, clearly. So yeah, absolutely. So what's an NGO? Sorry, you said the NGOs are supporting, of championing for this, uh, trying to support this. You mean championing for the criminality? Yeah, you said NGOs. Yeah. What's that sound for? There are several NGOs, many mental health NGOs, uh, namely MIASA. MIASA is Mental Illness um, Awareness and Support Association. Ah, okay. Yeah, several. There are several, but 
so their associations and things all championing for mental health and suicide awareness right. great okay right. brilliant right. it's good to clarify that it's interesting to look at this global statistics of criminalization of suicide and how it's evolved there's some countries that still prosecute suicide attempts right. but don't prosecute the people left behind but there's other countries that still but if you look at the wave going across the world there's hope is changing the picture's changing right. it's almost like one country then another country then another country then another country all just start to follow the same pattern of making it not criminal anymore and noticing this suicide right. noticing the mental health discourse the mental health awareness to say actually they need help like you've just said so there's hope <laughs> there's hope Right. But actually, I feel like, see, it's important. Okay, courage is definitely contagious. Uh So when one person struggling with mental health stand up and say, Mm. this has to stop. Instead of you shaming me, instead of you shunning me, you know, it's not helping. It's not helping you. It's not helping the society. It's not helping me. It's not helping anyone. So, you know, if one person, one NGO, one state, one country start to stand up and say, this has to stop, the stigma has to stop, then Mm. it becomes contagious. This courage becomes contagious. And, and, you know, and there's so much science behind it. It's not just us trying to say, hey, listen to us. This is something we feel strongly about. But there's so much research done and knowledge information and also at the end of the day these are human beings that we're talking about you know it's not just some yeah, yeah. it could be our our mom our dad our family members our wow. whoever and mm. speaking of the culture and the religion also islam is the main religion here 60 percent, i believe of muslims are in the country are in malaysia so islam is the main religion but and islam also say that kindness is an act of faith you know the prophet muhammad peace be upon him he said that if you don't have kindness you don't don't have faith you know so kindness is an act of faith so when people stigmatize people with mental health struggles then it's also say muslims or people need to be reminded that your faith is questionable if you don't have kindness and compassion for people who are struggling you know Mm. so yeah oh yeah kindness in the uk we lost someone a celebrity to suicide two years ago i want to say i don't know if that's right or not but it's about oh no it was a year ago caroline flack her name was she was a celebrity and from that we've all become aware of this idea of being kind and kindness can cure everything. So that's even us, we're still learning that whole concept of if we're just kind and we don't judge people on what we don't know, because we don't know what we're looking at. Just when we see somebody, there's a lot going on underneath that we can't see. Right. Right. And for me, it doesn't matter what your religion is, uh, what teaching you follow. Mm. What matters is compassion and kindness, you know, because yeah. if you don't have that, then yeah. wow. then that's problematic everywhere. So. so how's that impacted you, this, the fact that it's a criminal act in the country and you're now a suicide loss survivor? You're now living with that. How's that affected you and your grieving, would you say? I feel really sorry for people because the news really report on them. Like there are many reports on people who tried to attempt suicide and be criminalized. And I feel really sorry because their families can see them. You know, okay, sometimes some parts of the pictures are being censored, but still their family members would know definitely if they have to be thrown in jail, if they are being jailed, then of course the family members, the society, the neighbors would know. And I feel really sorry because they're definitely not criminals. How can you be wrong for struggling? How can you be wrong for, I don't know, they're not out there trying to hurt somebody else. I know the law was there. To deter them, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, to deter people from taking their lives. Yeah, yeah. But it's not helping anymore. You know, I think laws need to evolve with the need now. Things have changed, a lot have changed, and understanding and compassion mm. is necessary. It doesn't help just by putting them in jail and cause more problems for them and for the family and for everyone. Yeah, it just creates shame, doesn't it? It is, it is. It really just creates shame for the family, for everybody to have the picture. Right. So for you, when you lost somebody close, what impact did that have on you? Did you feel the shame? Did you feel the stigma? Because it was almost 10 years ago. So again, 10 years ago, a lot's changed in 10 years. You know, <laughs> What was it like back then for you? How did you cope? Did you just carry on as if nothing had happened did you fight like you are now with courage you know what was it like initially what did you go through not at all today and 10 years ago Mm. I'm totally different then back then there was a lot of shame a lot of shame confusion definitely it's hard enough to try to explain to myself 
what happened, what more trying to explain to people who are close to us, who meant well, who wanted to really understand what was going on, you know, what happened. So, but the saddest part, I feel, or the most painful part is when it was out in the news and in the social media, 10 years ago, people were not aware. There was almost zero comments on mental health, like trying to give hope or People saying, like, if you're struggling with mental health, please go and, you know, find for help and things like that. Uh, none, almost none, maybe one or two. But the majority of the comments were like, oh, this person goes to hell. And they're talking about my loved one here. When we hear suicide-related matters in Malaysia, I think, or perhaps anywhere, I don't know. But people would think that, oh, it would never happen to your loved one. Mm-hmm. It's something that would happen in another neighborhood, mm-hmm. another in only on Hollywood movies or in dramas you know things like that you know Mm -hmm. so when that happened to me personally it was a really big shock and I was in denial Mm. because it's not something that I could speak about or try to reach out for help I had to deal it on my own and I tried to make myself busy and not talk about it Mm -hmm. and be occupied with things I opened up a cafe and I was busy with my startup business but another grief hits that's when the whole volcano erupted and I could not deny it and I could not suppress. Mm. And suppressing is really dangerous, I feel, because you're not dealing with it. Still, there's emotions, painful, anger, mm. all those things buried inside you. And if you don't deal with it, mm. confront these feelings gently, they're still going to be there and they're still going to affect you. And only now, actually, I went to... <laughs> Honestly, I went to reach out for help mm-hmm. only in 2019. Okay. I was struggling with depression and anxiety. Yeah, that's when I thought I had to. And I was dealing with a lot of suicidal thoughts myself. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Then I realized the seriousness of it. You know, like Then I realized that, wow, my loved one could have been dealing with, must have been dealing with mental health condition that he could not see any other way but to end his life you know Mm. and because I got so scared that I was struggling with suicidal thoughts that's when I feel like I don't want to repeat this I don't want to hurt the people around Mm. me and things like that and I said to myself that I must look for help and I went I went to see a psychiatrist and here it's such a taboo Mm. it's highly stigmatized to go to seek for help for your mental health but I wish I could send convey the message that don't wait till it's so bad don't wait till your depression or your mental health conditions is so severe Mm. that you would then only go for help you know because early intervention is always better Mm -hmm. but still even if people are struggling to go get help even if it's not professional help that they look for Mm. I want people to reach out for help and that's why I feel it's important that more people are talking about it more NGOs more people are standing up and fighting up fighting for this and that's also the reason why I initiated founded AWAS AWAS it's only a social media platform Uh It's not an NGO yet, not yet, but because of the suicide awareness, I was able to find people who are in the same boat. I was able to connect with other suicide loss survivors Mm. in Malaysia and internationally. So that helped. That really helped a lot to have peer support. Yeah. So AWAS, A-W-A-S dot Malaysia, isn't it, on Instagram? So that's somewhere that you've set up. That's something you've set up in order to create support for you really but then for other people at all right be with other people that understand right because you didn't have that initially I went to an organization back then I tried to reach out to an organization who champions suicide awareness and prevention but because they didn't have any programs or any support for postvention didn't know what to do with me they said they're really sorry they took my details and they never called till today Mm. and now I think the government is really worried because of the pandemic the suicide case here in Malaysia is on the rise Mm -hmm. and now government is looking at postvention which I feel postvention is really important because the suicide loss survivors people who are bereaved by suicide people who have lost loved one family members colleagues whoever by suicide are the ones who are also in need of support in need of help Mm -hmm. And research have shown that suicide loss survivors are at higher risk of suicide themselves. And now the government is realizing that we need to do something, especially the postvention, because previously it's only suicide awareness and suicide prevention. Mm. There was no mentioning of postvention. Uh, helping those left behind, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is what you experienced, wasn't it? You said you've had that whole process of 
getting on with life for quite a long time by the sounds of it just running a business trying to cope suppressing right defending all of this because Freud would say that's defense mechanisms wouldn't they you know Freud would say we push everything down repress everything we cope on the outward surface because maybe I I think it's just because it's huge it's too big to maybe to process on your own or process without doing something whether it's through getting psychological support a professional support or doing something like running a marathon like I did or singing in the kitchen I know somebody else does and I've talked about this with other people how it's almost something outward we have to do and you're doing this through support group work through helping other people through your courageous act of speaking out and there's almost a doing a movement in that grief isn't there that has to happen and we have to heal the body not just the mind and there's this whole process of doing that and there's so many different ways of doing it and it's so interesting to hear your way and that happened because you were at a point you got to a point where the volcano erupted and you started having your own real difficulties emotionally anxiety depression and your own suicidal thoughts to the point where you thought, ah, I can't do this again. I can't hurt people because I've got to that point myself. And that's the point you got to where you said, okay, I need to be courageous here and start my own support group, which is a very brave thing to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You see, that's very interesting. A lot of people say that. People say that I'm courageous or I'm brave, but I don't have a choice. I feel like I don't have a choice. I have to. It's not a choice to be courageous or brave. I just have to be courageous and brave because I want to be supported and I want to support. You know, it's so important. I was there not getting support. I was there and feeling all hopeless and powerless and confused and scared and judged. But that's why I feel like this platform of or this peer support group will do good to other people who are struggling because they shouldn't be alone. No one should be alone in any kind of situation when they're struggling, I feel. You're right. I feel not everyone is good with talking or sharing mm. or telling what is really in their heart. Sometimes we have to know that we don't really have to talk, but just getting together, being together, being Mm -hmm. in solidarity with each other, that knowing that your struggles, somebody else is also feeling it and they would know and would understand you better, you know, not necessarily telling the person or telling anyone what really happened to you, but just knowing that you're a survivor and you need that support, you have that support. The support is available. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. And you had to make it yourself. (laughs) <laughs> with this group where you are facilitating it, you're <laughs> driving the group. How's that gone? How's it going? If you've got members in there that are helping you and you're helping them all at the same time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, both ways. And that's what I feel that's the beauty of it. Peer support group is about supporting each other in the same boat. Uh, going through the same thing Mm. because of COVID we were not able to meet physically Mm. but we have a WhatsApp group and we are connected through there I would share my worksheets anything that perhaps you know I feel like it's good for other people to work on their feelings write down you know journal or you know any videos or anything that I find Mm. will be helpful for them to know like mental health videos or information I would post and they would post but most of them would private message me instead of Um, talk in the group instead of reply in the group at first I felt kind of lonely like how come nobody's responding to me in the group Mm. because I wish it could be a two-way thing just because I initiated the support group doesn't mean that I'm all recovered or I'm all healed Mm -hmm. I would love for them to know that I'm just exactly like them you know we all have our struggles we all have our moments Mm -hmm. it's okay I know I guess I taught myself to be understanding and to accept the fact that they are comfortable texting me privately instead of in the group Mm -hmm. but for me what matters is that they know the support is there you know they know we have each other in case Yeah. yeah and it's only five of us to be honest only five of us in the group that's why I feel like I need to talk more about this so that other people who are in need uh, knows there is such thing as this here you know support group uh, uh-huh. not that I really want to go out there and tell people what happened to me because on one hand I feel like Malaysia is tough Malaysians are quite judgmental and are not open to this topic mm. but on the other hand I feel like I need to do this so that 
I can support and be supported and because I want change at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I struggle with, but at the same time, I'm clear. I know why I'm doing this. I know I want to do this, Uh but at the same time, I feel scared too. I feel worried for being misunderstood, for being judged for. But hopefully, you know, I'm glad that you want to be connected with ours. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that we are having this conversation because it's good to know that people around the world for this cause are also supporting and would want to hear about about this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very much so. It just shows the importance of culture in how we grieve. I think it really shows how many of us go through the coping, the resilient, oh, I'll just get on with work. I'll just, my research shows that we'd all get on with this real sense of, oh, I can just pretend it didn't happen, but you can't. And that then you often see that explosion, the volcano at some point happen where someone says, mm, maybe I need to deal with this now <laughs> when they're ready. And I think <laughs> right. that's the important part when they're ready, when the volcano's hit and they're ready. Right. And that can be done in their own way. And I think all of that can change with cultural change. I do believe that the cultural change of my research shows the cultural aspect of that makes a big difference. And again, that's why you're doing Hours. That's why I'm doing this podcast, so we can hear these stories and spread awareness and spread this understanding of what it's like for us left behind, really, right. and what it's left, how we process that. Right. And when you connected with me through Instagram, mm. I was really thrilled, you know, a suicide grief specialist <laughs> wanting to connect with me because it's really, it's not easy to find specific like support yeah. because grief, yes, there's a lot of, yeah. I don't know, honestly, I've never even heard of grief specialists. Perhaps there is out there in Malaysia. It's just that mm. maybe they go by psychologists or psychiatrists, you know, just the uh, general yeah. uh-huh. But of course, in the Western world, there's, you know, more specific. Yeah, that's why I've done it, because there's, I found it really hard for me finding somebody. I couldn't find anybody. I found support groups, lots of support groups through charitable organisations, but it didn't feel right for me. I didn't want to go to a local support group. I didn't feel... As a professional, I just didn't want to. It wasn't, and again, we all resonate with different things. Support groups helped lots of people. Those charities are amazing. They help so many people. It just wasn't right for me. And I ended up with a therapist who understood, but it didn't feel like it. It necessarily recognises the trauma that's within a lot of these losses. There's trauma involved. And I'm really passionate about highlighting that aspect. It's different to grief. It's different, full stop. We can't necessarily specify how it's different because we are all different. <laughs> so I, there's a lot of links with traumatic deaths. Yeah. Other types of traumatic death, there's a lot of links with suicide, but still, it's still different to traumatic deaths. Yeah. <laughs> it's still different yeah. to sudden traumatic deaths. So there's links to all of it, but it's different. And I think as soon as we recognize that as a society across the world, that it's different, right. then we can put things in place like specialists who know it's different and can know what the commonalities are, if there are any, and what the themes are, if there are any, right. because they're different for everybody, okay. <laughs> and then help totally. help to process that journey. Because like you said, it doesn't disappear. You don't suddenly say, I'm healed. Like you said, you feel recovered, but you're not. Yeah. It's a very odd place to be, isn't it? And I feel the same. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a very interesting thing you highlighted, trauma. People, I think, I don't know, because I guess here in Malaysia that people sweep everything under the carpet, right? Like they don't want it because... I guess I was, as a suicide loss survivor, I was expected to deal with it behind closed doors Mm. because I was not able to talk about it or grieve openly the way I grieved about I've lost my dad to cancer. Mm. And it was totally different. There was a real huge difference losing a loved one to suicide and losing someone to cancer. And I remember someone asking me, yeah, she said, oh, it's been at that point of time, it was five years that I've lost a loved one to suicide. And she said, it's been five years and you're still not over it. And then mm, oh, and I'm I like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. I don't think I'll ever be over this. You know, it, I, I guess people expect it to be like grieving the loss of a normal death. Yeah. I, think, I don't know, even normal death. No, no, it's not the right word, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no right words. Yeah, yeah it's just, I don't know. And I, I think really the diff- I, I've really thought a lot about that. And I think the difference is... I've lost my mum as well. I lost my mum to a natural death. Right. So she had a disease and she died, you know, slowly and it was horrible and we all grieved and it was awful. But what I didn't have to do then was identify with suicide. And I think that's the big difference when you start to understand the word and the construct and the social construct of the word suicide like you have in society. 
I think that's the massive impact that we have to get to know. And that's why a lot of us do podcasts and you're doing your hours and we all do things to understand and almost develop a relationship with suicide. It feels as if because it wasn't us, we didn't do it. We didn't. <laughs> we're still here. Right. We didn't adopt the suicide word into our life. We don't, We didn't bring that construct into our life. Right. But our very, very close loved one did. Our very, very close one felt that they had to do that. So we then develop this construct for them. We then develop a relationship with the word suicide. We have to. And I don't think, again, it feels like a drive to me. I can't not do this. I cannot not specialise in suicide. Right. Because this construct is part of my life now. And I, I cannot ignore it. It's too big to ignore. It's too big. It's a calling, right? I feel like it's a calling for me. Yeah. Like uh-huh. There's not a day, almost 10 years has passed, there is not a day goes by that I do not think of my loved one. Yeah, and it's not something that I can just erase or let it slide. Mm -hmm. It's just right there all the time on my mind, in my heart. So it is a calling. It's something I feel like I must do, especially hopefully to prevent it from happening in the society and really to get people to get help when they're struggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get everybody, whether you're... (laughs) I I end up talking about this at the end of every podcast, I seem to, the whole idea of talk Mm -hmm. talk tell somebody yeah tell somebody and I know when someone's suicidal I've spoken to suicide attempt survivors and they say it doesn't matter what anybody said it doesn't matter what anybody did they couldn't have you know talked me out of it or they couldn't have said anything to make it any better right and I understand that talking is not as easy sometimes as just talking but if you can reach out and get professional help or just speak to somebody who you feel that you isn't going to judge you if you can just reach out to somebody who you feel that can just hold you in that space Mm. because with psychology I think I've heard you say this on one of your because you were on YouTube recently weren't you and I heard you talking about we are not our thoughts our thoughts are really powerful they feel real they absolutely 100% feel real when we say to ourselves I'm worthless it feels like we're worthless you know we believe our thoughts our brains are so amazingly clever (laughs) you know (laughs) that they fool us into thinking that the thoughts are real and they're not it is a thought and that's what I do as a therapist. I, I help people to diffuse from those thoughts to say, ah, look, that's a thought. Really? It's over there. It's not me. It's not, it's not real. It's not reality. Yeah. And that's what you can do by talking to somebody. You can make it less real just by saying it out loud. But that takes a lot when you're in a culture that won't hear it. So that's why the cultural aspects have a, such a big impact. And how you're doing what we're all doing on this journey of suicide is by just saying the word I feel like just saying the word suicide 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 just saying (laughs) (laughs) to make it more normal in inverted columns you know commas you know acceptable a word that we can say yeah Yeah. same as mental health yeah yeah so that when someone's ready to speak and diffuse their thoughts and allow their thoughts to reach the air right they've got a place to do it and that's what you're creating that's amazing brilliant Right, right. Brilliant. The other day, I was talking to um, a psychiatrist. He's a doctor um, dealing with a patient with substance issues. Uh-huh. And he said the family refused to provide help, refused to get him, mm. the person, to support him to get help because it's easier for them because it was translating. It started with substance abuse and then it was affecting his mental health. He was hallucinating and all that. Mm. So the doctor, the psychiatrist said the condition started with the substance abuse. Mm. That started the mental health condition mm-hmm. and the support and, you know, let's get him for treatment and all that. But the parents were saying, no, 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 don't worry about it he's actually going through like some spiritual crisis Uh because it's easier I guess it's easier for people to say he's being possessed by some spiritual elements or things like that because Mm -hmm. then they shift the blame they put the responsibility not so much the blame but the responsibility on something else rather than to own up to having oh my son is struggling with a you know substance addiction and yada yada yeah but then it stops him getting help, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If they took responsibility, if they were able to, then they could take responsibility then for getting him help. They could ring the psychiatrist and say, help my son, couldn't they? I guess it's just that link, isn't it? It's simple, really, isn't it? Right. But it's not simple at all. It's complicated because they've got their own history with religion and spirituality yeah. and law as yeah. well. They're in different and we're all, yeah. And dealing with other people. Mm. I think the Asian culture in particular are so worried about what people say. Uh-huh. What would people say? So it's better to say it's spiritual possession, then it's not anyone's fault. It's something that is beyond our control and things like that. So Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. It's big stuff, isn't it? It's complicated. And it's a complicated picture for everybody. And we've all got to do our best, haven't we, to help those that we can with them be there, people when they're ready. Right. Like you are. 
when they're ready. So how can people find you? They can find you on Instagram. Can they find you anywhere else? On Facebook as well. Okay, is that the same name? Just AWAS? Yes. A-W-A-S, full stop Malaysia. A-W-A-S stands for Awareness Against Suicide Malaysia. Okay. So it's supposed to be an awareness social media platform. But at the same time, you can find post-venture support for suicide loss survivors. So, okay. Yeah. Just out of interest, is it just for Malaysians? Can anyone access the support in any country? Or is it really there for Malaysians to get the support that they need? No. The reason why I put them Malaysia so that mm. Malaysians specifically know that yeah. because there was no help before. This. There was no support group, right? Yeah. So that was the reason why I put Malaysia, so that Malaysians are aware. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be only for Malaysians. I have actually connected with suicide loss survivors from all over the world. Even we have someone, a Malaysian, but living in Japan. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wow. Got in touch with us to get support. And also a Canadian guy who just lost a brother to suicide. And he DM'd me. He texted me on Instagram. And he said, mm. thank you so much for this page, for this Instagram post, all your posts. A lot of your posts resonate with me and I feel supported. You know, it's so beautiful, you know, mm. being connected to anyone all over the world. I feel like it's such a big great. Yeah. Right, so and now with you. With yeah. <laughs> so anyone could get in touch with you anywhere. Brilliant. So nice to hear. Yeah. So before we finish, is there anything else you want to leave people with in terms of if they've lost someone to suicide? You're almost 10 years on. What could you leave them with just to end any bits of hope or understanding that you've learned that can help? Definitely. I want people to know. I want suicide loss survivors to know that there is hope. Mm. And if you're struggling, especially with suicidal thoughts yourself, your thoughts do not have to be an action. Like we said earlier, there is hope. Reach out. It's important to know that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to feel really down, really low. It's okay to feel like it's end of the world. It's like end of the world even. Mm. But it's not okay to be alone and struggle alone and let your thoughts, let your feelings, let your emotions drown you. And it's important. It's really important. Please know that there is help. There is support. You just got to reach out your hand and seek out for help. Mm, yeah, thank you. I did a bit of calculations a couple of weeks ago that 800,000 people take their lives across the world right. by suicide. That was the latest figures, but that was two years ago. So it'd be really interesting to see the latest ones when they come out with the pandemic. Every 40 seconds? Ah, every 40 seconds. Okay. Every 40 seconds, someone dies by suicide. And wow. every 41 seconds, someone is left trying to make sense of it, right? So Wow. Yeah. And if there's 800,000 that die by suicide, and the statistics say, they're not quite sure, like anything, but... They say between six and 36, I think, people are affected by suicide, one suicide loss. So if there's six people, even the minimum amount that are affected, that are left behind, right? that's almost four and a half million a year people left behind. That's the minimum amount of people left behind. So when Kaki say kind of there's somebody out there who can help, that's a lot of people that can help you because for every year, if there's at least four and a half million, at least that understand what you're going through, that's how many people that are out there. That can support we can all support each other and that's my tagline you know is we're stronger together right we absolutely are. and all of those people left behind from suicide like you like me we're stronger together yeah and also people need to know that we don't necessarily have the answer no. we don't have the no. magic pill to give you and make all your pain disappear it doesn't work that way but there are people who care there are people who's right there who are willing to listen or be there, you know, even if you don't want to talk about it, but just be there and know, you know, because to have someone validating those feelings, you know, those emotions, I think that's really powerful. When I was diagnosed, when I developed clinical depression and anxiety, right, I felt really relief for being diagnosed mm. because it became clear to me that, oh, someone is validating my feelings and I'm not creating this up. Because of the fear and the shame, like I feel like I have to carry this alone. Mm. So having the diagnosis actually validated those feelings and it's so important. So I feel like the support is right there to validate, to know that what you are going through matters. Yeah. And you matter despite all the pain and struggles. So. Yeah, I love that. I love that ending. You matter. Yeah. You matter. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to call this episode... <laughs> Courage is contagious. I love that. And I think that's what we should call this because it's all, that's you and you matter and your courage. Thank you. I hope will be contagious for many people, especially in Malaysia, who need the courage to reach out, who need the courage to say, yeah, take, reach out their hand and say, 
you know, help me, validate me, validate my feelings. Right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us here today. I hope it's served you and given you something for your journey with suicide. Come back and subscribe, like, do whatever you need to do on your platform to help us to raise awareness of suicide because the more we keep saying the word, the more we can gain support for us left behind and the more we can raise awareness of the word and how society sees it and reduce this stigma that's so attached to it. Please get in touch. You can find me on my website, suicidegriefsupport.com. I really want to hear from you. But for now, please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And remember, we are stronger together.